Good morning. My name is Richard Canarelli, and I have the pleasure and honor of welcoming you to another long-distance worship service of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Venice. Our congregation strives to be a beacon of liberal religion in Florida's Sun Coast and a refuge for all who seek a welcoming community, no matter your color, creed, ability, or class, no matter who you love, your gender expression, political affiliation, or religious belief. We do not hand you a document or text and tell you what you must believe in in order to be part of our congregation. Instead, you are free to find, explore, and walk down your own spiritual path. The only thing we ask is that you respect the spiritual paths of others that may be different from yours. If you would like to know more about this congregation and its many opportunities for learning, growth, and connection, you can peruse our calendar and announcements on Facebook or on our webpage at uucov.org. If you're watching this on YouTube, please remember to like this video by hitting the thumbs up icon below. Leave us a note in the comment section and click on the subscribe button on your YouTube channel. COVID-19 has hit many nonprofit organization budgets hard and this congregation is no different. Please consider clicking the donate button on our website and giving as generously as you can. We hope you'll find something in the service that speaks to you and maybe lifts you up or challenges you in ways that lead to spiritual reflection and personal growth. We're glad you've chosen to join us. Welcome to church today. The prelude begins our worship. Our call to worship comes from the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 12. 
For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, and the time of singing has come. Let's worship together. Our hymn is number 64. Oh, give us pleasure in the flowers today. Uh, those lyrics are by Robert Frost, and we'll sing the first verse. Children have their own religious education class by Zoom each Sunday at 10 a.m. If you'd like to join that class or help your child to attend, login information can be found on our Facebook page or on our website at uucov.org. This week we have words here from the late astronomer and scientist Carl Sagan. There are now four spacecraft which are beyond the orbit of Neptune and Pluto, Pioneers 10 and 11, Voyagers 1 and 2, four vehicles of our species plummeting into the interstellar dark. Now of all those worlds, we have no indication of life. For me, that underscores the rarity and preciousness of the Earth and the life upon it. And you can see it looks like more than a dot, but it is in fact less than a pixel. You can see that it is uh, slightly blue, and uh, this is where we live, on a blue dot. On that blue dot, that's where everyone you know and everyone you ever heard of and every human being who ever lived, lived out their lives a very small stage in a great cosmic arena. Just speaking for myself, I think this perspective underscores our responsibility to preserve and cherish that blue dot, the only home we have. Let's join together in a spirit of prayer and meditation that begins with the poem, The Summer Day, by Mary Oliver. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, 
how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? We lift up those in this community who face change, challenge, or loss this day as we hold within our hearts all who suffer. Now we pray, each in our own ways, into the silence. The hopes of this community are offered forth in the names of all those who've gone before and in the names of all those who will come after, in the names of all the helpers of humankind. Shalom, Salam, Amen, and blessed be. Our interlude is a piece called Evening. It's by Madhav the Wandering Flautist. Florida, our fair state, is sometimes reviled in other parts of the country because of the behavior of its citizens, mostly. Any headline that includes the words Florida man or Florida woman is likely to contain something that could be called news of the weird. So we know it can sometimes be weird here. But we also know that we live in a beautiful place. We know that the natural environment that surrounds us here in the subtropics nurtures an amazing array of life. The house plants that Linda and I used to work so hard to just keep alive indoors in the north go crazy here. Philodendrons, Schefflera, orchids, bromeliads. Instead of being sensitive house plants, you just stick these things into the sand uh, <clears throat> into the sand outside, and they quickly blossom into forests of their own. I know not everything out there is a Florida native. I remember Dave Griffin and maybe others made sure that the plantings. Uh, we have around our pond out here are native species, so thank you very much, Dave, and others for that. But I'm sure that some of the things we could see around us 
are not native species, and I appreciate the desire to move back toward native species in our plantings. I do. Myself, though, I don't drive along the highways getting livid every time I see a non-native variety on the roadside. If I did, I would have to spend my entire life irritated and annoyed. And here's the thing. I want to choose something different today. I want to choose some other inner emotional state for myself. I want to choose something like hope for the future and gratitude for the good, the true, and the beautiful I see all around me. Besides, think about how far I would have to go to find a completely unspoiled wilderness anywhere. Every place we humans have ever been, we've changed and adapted to our uses. Have the changes always been good? Certainly not. I even noticed that our little space rover named Perseverance has already begun littering on Mars, dropping a little shroud into the dust, simply driving away. So we've already trashed the moon, and now Mars, there's nowhere unsullied by our hubris. Now we're part of nature, so maybe this is nature's way. And if we take a longer view, maybe a year, maybe a few thousand years, we can rest assured that this planet will wipe us humans off of the map clean itself up, and continue the process of life. Now, if that sounds overly hopeful, good. Hopeful and grateful is what I'm going to choose this morning as I look outside at the world that surrounds us. So, however you began your day feeling this morning, I want to invite you into a spirit of hopefulness and gratitude as we gather, if only virtually, in this beautiful, more or less natural space this morning. As with any place of sanctuary in any of our churches, synagogues, mosques, temples, in your living room or on your lanai, or a million other sacred places, wherever it is you find yourself on the planet as you participate right now is uniquely blessed by our presence together just as we are each blessed by one another's presence. When I got here this morning I wanted to throw open all the doors but our audio and video system limits the amount of noise and light that we can effectively deal with. So I opened a few doors around to let as much nature flow through as possible. Because, I thought, since some of us call ourselves religious people, this would be a really good day to talk about something called natural religion. Now the embodiment of and a prophetic voice for natural religion is a guy who started out in our tradition and then expanded into many others. It's the 19th century essayist and philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson. Waldo, as he was known by friends and loved ones, was from a family of Unitarian ministers and so became one himself. Graduating from Harvard Divinity School and then being called to the pulpit of Second Unitarian Church in Boston in 1829. Three short years later in 1832, exhausted by the work of the parish, no shock there, hounded by personal tragedy, his young wife Ellen had died, Troubled of mind and spirit, 
He had developed misgivings about communion and public prayer. Mr. Emerson quit the work of the church, at least overtly, and began a writing and speaking career. Over time, following his lead, Americans by the droves would leave the drab environs, environs of the church sanctuary to seek spiritual connection in the natural world. In 1838, six years after leaving parish ministry, Emerson spoke to a group of young ministers gathered to celebrate the ordination of one of their new colleagues, Jared Sparks, and Emerson admitted to them that church, as he experienced it, left him cold. He told that group, <clears throat> and by extension all of America, because his words were quickly and broadly published as the Divinity School Address, he told that group that he could find in the preachers he had heard no evidence that they had ever laughed or cried, no evidence that they had been in relationship with another human being, no evidence that they had ever loved or lost or loved again, no evidence that they had ever experienced life or, in fact, had ever been fully alive. For Emerson, it was the world that he could see outside the window behind the preacher that was real, not the tired pseudo-truths echoing within the dank walls of New England churches. Now, because he was disgusted with the church, capital C, church, that he found so lifeless, Waldo took a walk. He took to the woods as his sanctuary, and there he found God in all God's glory. Those are words that he might have used, but that you may need to translate. Emerson saw in the woods evidence of a unity and a oneness amid the delightful diversity of nature. He said, we see, because of our human limitations, in part and particle. Whereas out in nature, one begins to see the connections among all the parts and all the particles. One begins to see all creation as a unified whole. He hypothesized that everything is in God as he understood the word God, that God is in everything, and that if we'll go out into nature, we'll see things that we otherwise would not. Now, this all seems a direct echo of something the Apostle Paul said. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then we will see face to face. In other words, if we avail ourselves of the possibilities, our vision will become clearer and our hearts will expand. So when you have a chance to go look, just see what you see. I should also say here that if this little word, God, has just stopped you in your tracks, I get it. I understand. It's a word that has been used badly by far too many people for far too long. But I want to invite you to set aside just for a moment your own belief system or unbelief system or whatever you currently have or don't have and try to see that little word God more as Emerson saw it not as referring to an anthropomorphic super being or to some old white guy in the sky running things from somewhere up there, but simply God as the nature of things, as the force that connects all that is, the force that is in all that is, the force that is all that is. And that's not something you have to believe in or not. It's something that's just the way it is. 
Now, I'm not trying to convince you to believe differently than you do. I'm trying to invite you to look out there and be moved. I have a well-regarded Unitarian Universalist ministerial colleague, widely respected as a leader in humanist circles, whom I've heard say to gatherings, large and small, that we Unitarian Universalists are not a movement in the proper sense, that we are instead a religion, which is challenging, certainly, to some of my other esteemed colleagues to say nothing of vast numbers of the laity. She explains that our religion, whether we like to remember it or not, has as part of our history some particular theologies. She says that when you boil down our historical religion and our historical theology into its simplest terms, it is this that Unitarian theology says that God, or whatever you choose to call divinity or the mystery at the center of life, that Unitarian theology says that God is one, a unity. And Universalist theology, in its simplest terms, says that God or whatever you choose to call divinity or the mystery at the center of life. Universalist theology says that God is love. So historically, in Unitarian Universalism, God is one, and that one is love. Again, I'm not trying to convince you what to believe or what not to believe. I am saying that this religion that we are a part of, this tradition we've either been born into or adopted as our own, this thing we're doing together this morning has historically made the claim that everything is one and everything is love. And so how that works out in your own life is up to you. How you understand your own experience is yours to articulate in your own language. Now, if you could use a language of hope and gratitude, Here we are this morning, as open as we can be to the natural world, as Emerson admonished us to be once in a while. And if we look, we can see the lily pads. We can see the water. We can see the grasses. We might even see a bird or a bee. All those entities that the Unitarian minister William Ellery Channing called in an 1819 sermon in Boston, the radiant signatures of the infinite spirit. And maybe if you try, the next time you find yourself sitting here in this holy place or any other holy place, you could open yourself to a sense of the oneness of these things, to the oneness of nature, to the oneness of God, if you will. If you could, I bet you wouldn't be the first to be able to do so. I was born almost 150 years after Emerson. But I can well remember the old preacher in the little church of my youth lamenting many Sunday mornings the number of people he knew who weren't in church that morning. The number of people who thought they could find God all by themselves out in nature. The number of people 
who thought they didn't need church at all, but could just as easily make do by making the rounds of a golf course on a Sunday morning. And what I didn't know then was that when I took the side of those who found God in nature, I was in fact siding with a Unitarian preacher named Ralph Waldo Emerson. And I hope you can see whatever you choose to call the mystery at the center of life or what Emerson might have called God. I hope you can see that as you look out on the vista behind me and that surrounds us this morning. But to say that this is all we need misses one other point in my estimation. As much as I find God or Channing's radiant signatures of the infinite out in nature, I also often have the sense that God lives in the space between me and another human being. God exists not just out there, but in here, in the interaction and the connection between you and me. Emerson thought it was the nature of God to be every, everything and everywhere, to be the whole of creation. And part of that whole lives right here, right now, even in the distance that has been imposed between us. We are who we are in relation to others. When we're unable to practice our relationality in community, we lose part of ourselves. And that's been made painfully clear these past months, long months of pandemic. But natural religion is love. And our calling as religious people is that we be lovers, that we be loving to one another, that we be loving to all creation. So, welcome to nature. Welcome to hopefulness and gratitude. Welcome to love. Welcome to life. Welcome to church this morning. Lahaim. So may it be. Our hymn is number 163, For the Earth Forever Turning. We'll sing verses 1 and 4. benediction has been attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. 
Where hate rules, let us bring love. Where sorrow, joy. Let us strive more to comfort others than to be comforted, more to understand others than to be understood, to love others more than to be loved. For it is in giving that we receive and in pardoning that we are pardoned. Go in peace, walk softly on your paths, and may the light of love shine on you all your days. Thank you.